the Charleston County Republican Party is gearing up for its annual Black History Month banquet at the Francis Marion Hotel this year in downtown Charleston. Today, I talk one-on-one -on -one with the chairman of the Charleston County Republican Party, Maurice Washington, for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and like Quentin's Close-Ups on Facebook. Maurice Washington, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. Hello, Quentin. Good to see you. Always, you're looking fit and trim. You must be running still, still yes. working out. Absolutely. Still doing that every week, every week. Absolutely. Well, good, 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 good. Thank you for uh, having me, my friend. Always good to speak with you. Yes, sir, because you're the chairman of the Charleston County Republican Party. And right next door, actually, is a big event coming up for you all next week, which is the third annual uh, Black History Banquet here in downtown Charleston. In fact, you said this on Facebook. You said this, quote, we are so excited for our fourth annual Black History Banquet, a legacy of strength, a future of hope on February 11th at the Francis Marion Hotel in downtown Charleston. Let me ask you, Maurice, what is the strength of the Charleston County Republican Party today? Um, I think we're, we're very strong. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of things we, we didn't do in the past, uh, in terms of community outreach, uh, although we're a political subdivision, we are focused a lot more on community engagement. So about 70% of our time, uh, I could say maybe spent on political stuff. Uh, the other thirty percent, we are focused on community, and and we do so through our annual uh, community uh, children Christmas uh, toy giveaway every Christmas, and we do it in the right way to float the Santa, the whole gambit. We were able to touch the lives of a little over two thousand kids this past December through our uh, turkey giveaway, our Thanksgiving turkey way uh, giveaway. Our partnership with the Charleston, uh, North Charleston Community Resource Center, uh, the partnership we're forging with the Low Country Food Bank. Uh, we have started conversation with Florence Crittenton uh, as another uh, potential partner. Uh, they will be at the banquet on on Friday night. I'm happy to say, but when 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 you talk about when we speak of our theme, a legacy of strength, a future of hope. We're actually talking about Africans, African Americans, uh, the strength that, um, that developed within us as a people as a result of suffrage, right? Uh, and through that strength, we, we have always maintained uh, hope for the future. We just came up with the theme a legacy of strength, a future of hope, as a symbolic message of, or as a people. Yes, sir. Okay. What are those other conversations you're having right now about community engagement within the Charleston County Republican Party? Good question. Um, schools, uh, public education uh, is another. Uh, we, last year, organized our very first uh, education standing committee. Uh, with uh, a particular focus of engagement with the school board and, uh, and schools uh, throughout the Charleston uh, uh, region. Uh, better communication between ourselves and school board members, uh, and um, which is, you know, education is everybody's business, so we, we have a lot of fun uh, doing that. We try not to dictate but engage uh, in respectful ways to connect our message uh, in, in the hope of, um, of having our voice elevated and heard. Uh, we also have a, a very, very good communications uh, standing committee as well. Uh, when we engage communities, we engage through honesty and integrity and, and genuineness. Uh, and so we're always trying to find ways to help nonprofit, community nonprofits, uh, support their outreach activities because their activities go a very, very long way in um, working to improve quality of life for citizens of Charleston County. What is the quality of life in Charleston County, particularly with the engagement of the Charleston County Republican Party? 
Uh, well, you know, COVID is uh, is a beast, and um, uh, but I think we are finding our uh, our sea legs again in terms of how we deal with this beast uh, and and try to build back to some level of normalcy, normalcy in our community. Uh, we are resilient people, uh, and um, you know, you just can't keep Americans locked down like forever. Uh, pretty soon, we, we find the strength to um, uh, to be more careful, uh, but at the same time, not allow Big Brother, meaning the government, to just shut us down. You know, suicide rates are up uh, literally by 30, high 30% among teenagers. Uh, this is depression is up, uh, mental health up, death up. This, this virus is a beast on so many different fronts. And people are ready to, to return to some sense of, of normalcy. So uh, we understand that. So we try to engage folks on their term and their comfort zone. Uh, and it's been uh, working out for us. What is your comfort zone within the Charleston County Republican Party? Well, I'm very comfortable. Uh, look, we, we have, um, you know, it's a big Ten party. So we have, uh, you know, and within the big bubble, we have these smaller bubbles and, uh, and uh, managing uh, the bubbles and trying to keep everybody uh, looking big picture and being a part of the big picture. I would admit, oftentimes, it is a challenge. Uh, but, um, but it's one that I welcome. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm straight laced in terms of what I feel. Uh, I'm thoughtful. Uh, I try to hear all sides and not take sides uh, and then try to render decisions that I believe is, uh, uh, is in the best interest of the party, not of a particular bubble or a particular jewel, uh, but what's best for the party. And, um, uh, and that tends to work for me. Now, it, it doesn't always please people, but it, it, it does tend to work for me. I can sleep at night, in other words. What those challenges, Maurice, what is your political script as a party? I think, um, I think, I think we have solid strength, uh, as a party. You know, we, we're the party that believes not that the Democrats absolutely does not, because there are plenty of Democrats who, who believe as we do that America is the greatest country, um, uh, ever develop, uh, that um, uh, there is a place still in America for, uh, for faith and worshiping uh, and free speech and, uh, and the right to bear arms and First Second Amendments. And uh, our strength is that um, we believe in freedom. Uh, we believe in smaller government, low taxes. Uh, school choice. I pre uh, refer prefer to refer to it as um, parental choice uh, and um, a free market. Uh, and so I, I think most Americans believe that still. We've had some ups and downs along the way as we make adjustments, as I said, through uh, COVID and, uh, and some of the other things that, that we are such as open borders and no border security how do we you know how do we how do we correctly uh, patrol and control and protect the borders while at the same time still remaining to be uh, a country where where all races of people are welcome uh, and so uh, oftentimes when we speak of border security, folks say, oh, we're racist. We're trying to keep people out. No, a country without a border is not a country. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, you're welcome, but you have to come in uh, legally. So when illegal immigrants enter the country, it does have an adverse impact, not just on America as a country, but on its citizenry as well, especially African-Americans, because those cheap labor put 
African American labor on the back burner. Uh, so, and, and, and lots of African Americans are stepping forward and, and basically uh, uh, pushing back uh, for that very same reason. Uh, these are uh, illegal immigrants that are knocking uh, Americans, American citizens, uh, out of employment and uh, lost opportunities to support themselves and their families. Now, uh, how many of those African Americans are being affected by this? I, I would say, you just drive downtown, downtown Charleston, right here in our backyard, and look at all of the development and construction taking place. 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, particularly on the east side of Charleston, those were African American men doing and performing those 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 work, those jobs. Today, they are Hispanics, uh, and um, not saying that none are naturalized citizens or 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 now American citizens, uh, but when you suffer. Uh, replacement of, of African Americans with illegal immigrants in the workforce, there is an impact felt, a serious impact. And I think that percentage is a very large percentage. I hear it all the time, the complaints uh, about um, work once work opportunities once plentiful for African-Americans, especially African-American males, are now marginalized to uh, uh, almost nothing as a result of the cheaper labor that's uh, now in the country. In the country. And, and earlier you talked about, obviously, school choice, and you said, hey, it's parental choice. What is your definition of parental choice? And what are the benefits of that? Yeah, I, I think ultimately the parents... Uh, have the right to determine what's best for their children's education. Uh, not, not government, not school boards, not school districts. Uh, and so when I speak of parental rights, uh, parents tend to know their children, uh, shortcomings and strength better than anyone. And so, and they understand the environment that that their children best excel in. And so when I think of parental right, I think of those kinds of things. Uh, parents should have the right uh, to determine the school choice of their children. Now, obviously, if, if you adequately fund schools uh, and, um, and work hard to make all neighborhood schools excellent, most parents would choose to send their kids to what their neighborhood school, uh, but if their neighborhood schools lack what parents believe is in the best interest of their children, parents should have a right to then determine where to send their child to be educated. Now, going back to what you talked about earlier, as far as cheap labor, how cheap will the labor continue to be here in this country in the next five to ten years? Well, for as long as labor can be cheap, <laughs> corporate America will try to find a way to integrate that cheap labor into their uh, business model. Because bottom line, the cheaper the labor, the more the profit margin. Uh, and so it's, it's, I think it's here to stay. Even if we tighten up border, uh, border security, uh, we, we, we tighten up the, um, the process of, of, becoming a, a legal citizen. Uh, cheap labor is always going to be high on the food chain of uh, corporate America. And going back to obviously the dunks around here, but, but, but this was the question about I me mean, to talk obviously about the parental choice. What are the schools here in the low country are, that are being affected by all of these changes? You're talking about um, as a result of parents having choice? Yes, sir. Um, well, I, I think a bigger question is uh, the price we pay by not ensuring that all schools are of the caliber of, say, a academic magnet or a Bruce 
Buse or a, um, a School of the Arts or a St. Andrew's Math and Science or a James Allen Charter. I think that's the, that's the bigger question, the most important question. Uh, in terms of parents exercising school choice, I don't see that as the driving problem or, or force against public education. Because mind you, the schools I just referenced right. are public schools as well. Right. <laughs> They're even charter schools are public schools. Right. Uh, and uh, I think the school district operates some or have a partnership with some 16 or so uh, public charter schools right here in Charleston County. So, you know, charter schools, academic magnet, uh, uh, St. Andrews Math and Science, uh, Rivers here at right. Grove and King. Right. Uh, all of them are, are public schools, and, and parents, if given the choice to have their kids in a high-performing academic environment rather than a marginal academic environment, they're going to go for that higher. So how do you solve that problem? Make them all high-performing academic environment. And that was my question to you as well. But, and speaking of most of those schools of which are downtown, let me go back to the Black History Month uh, event. What is the biggest yeah. difference, uh, Maurice, from four years ago to right now, when you think of the Black History Banquet? Well, <laughs> I'm not sure if you were one of our honorees the very first year or the second year. Uh, but man, when we first started um, down this road, it was, it was kind of rough. Not, not everyone bought into it. Uh, uh, it it, it created uh, an incredible backlash from some elements of the community. I know you personally experienced some backlash as a result of showing up and accepting uh, this um, this beautiful award right, right. here. Right. You know the uh, the North Star uh, Award, and um, and you you earned it. We were uh, very very pleased to um, to present you uh, with it. Uh, and I'm happy to have you as my guest on the uh, 11th of February at Francis Marion Hotel as one of our past honorees. Uh, so, but nonetheless, when we first did it, it was a sellout. Lots of folks thought it was going to fall flat. Folks were not going to engage and participate. Uh, and the first year we, we sold out. The second year we sold out. The third year we, we sold out. We didn't do it last year because of COVID. We're back this year. And uh, we're trending towards, what, another sellout, and that's why we moved the event from the Citadel uh, uh, Alumni House to the uh, Francis Marion uh, Hotel. So uh, we're going to be giving away uh, uh, contributions to nonprofit uh, who will be in attendance, um, and uh, we're going to use whatever proceeds we earn to continue our incredible outreach activities from our food giveaway uh, and, and turkey giveaway, two separate events to our community children Christmas party, our backpack projects where we, we buy hundreds of backpacks and, and present to children at the K6, K7 uh, grade levels. Uh, and um, so, you know, th this, this banquet is not just to recognize outstanding citizens, eight of whom uh, I think represent um, uh, uh, a future of hope for not just Charleston, but South Carolina in the country. And I, if you don't mind, I'd like to say uh, who they are. Uh, some of you have, have made their marks and are being recognized as a result of their contributions. Uh, others stand on the shoulder of of, of them and, uh, and and our ancestry and are very very poised to uh, to do big things for uh, for the community as well. So this year's honoree uh, is uh, Alyssa E. Richardson. She's a uh, she's the uh, state director first. African American female or African American to hold a state director position for a United States Senator. In this case, it's uh, U.S. Senator Tim Scott. Not only is she the state director of his office, she's also his national uh, deputy director. So Alyssa Richardson is going to be one of our honorees, a, a, a Harvard grad, 
uh, and um, just a very, very bright uh, young lady. And uh, we're looking forward to um, uh, her receiving the award on February 11th. Corey Alston, you might know Corey. Uh, he's a Gullah Sweet Bass uh, uh, producer, maker, inventor. Uh, he's an author as well. Uh, his work is in the Smithsonian. He's a solid brother. Uh, first time uh, receiving the award. Looking forward to uh, him uh, as well, Dr. Erica Taylor, uh, who is the Charleston County uh, School District uh, Communications Director. Uh, and uh, is doing a great job there. Barney Blakely. Uh, Barney's been around a very long time, freelance. Uh, look, if, if you've lived in Charleston, you have been shaped by his writing with the Charleston Chronicle over the many, many, many years. Uh, there's Elder James Johnson, uh, community activist, community organizer, uh, uh, president uh, of, uh, used to be uh, state president of uh, the National uh, Na National Action Network. That's right. it. Uh, and uh, branched off and 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 started his own uh, uh, nonprofit and and growing it at a national scale pace as well. Good for him. Nathaniel Spells, who is the CEO of Construction Dynamics Incorporated, one of the largest black-owned construction companies uh, in South Carolina. Uh, very charitable kind of guy, even though he lives in Columbia. A lot of the nonprofits that he support or supports are right here in the, in the low country in the Charleston area. Uh, and then there are two legendary personalities. Uh, uh, Senator Glenn, former senator, former lieutenant governor, former president of the College of Charleston, uh, Glenn McConnell. Uh, Glenn will be our first non-African American honoree, and when I brought Glenn's name, folks, well, but he's not—he's not black, no. But what he has done in partnership with Senator Robert Ford, who is our eighth honoree, the—the uh, the public funding that they channeled to HBCUs in the state of South Carolina, your Benedict, your Morris, your Claflin, your Allen, uh, public funds which before those two guys collaborated was a no, no, you couldn't do that. Uh, but they found a way to, uh, to make it work, uh, and direct now hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, to those institutions, private HBCU, uh, institution in the state of South Carolina. It was Glenn McConnell, for example, who called me up. I was chairman of the board of trustees at SC state. And he called me up and said, Hey, look, uh, could you find me someone that I can appoint to the um, uh, the endowed chair uh, part, which which is part of the lottery commission? And and he wanted to be a state grad. And at the time, there were three uh, what we call research institutions receiving uh, or sharing four or twelve million dollars each. Received uh, four million uh, each. So there were Clemson University receiving four of the 12, uh, USC uh, receiving four of the 12 million, uh, and um, MUSC receiving four. So 12 million split three ways, each receiving $4 million. Well, Glenn McConnell added a chair, an endowed chair to that table, and that endowed chair went to whom? South Carolina State University. So for the past, I don't know, 14, 16 years now, South Carolina State has received uh, $3 million each year from the 12 as a result of Glenn McConnell adding that fourth chair to the table. And, and I think he should be recognized as a result of his work. Black judges uh, increased by over 30% in the state of South Carolina because of the dual uh, uh, partnership of a Glenn McConnell and a Robert Ford. So we believe it's only fitting that we recognize and honor the two uh, together uh, that night. So it should be uh, a fascinating uh, night. Our corporate sponsorship also, uh, Quentin, it has doubled since we, you asked what, what has been the changes. Well, our corporate sponsorship have doubled since the very first and the second uh, banquet and uh, so corporate 
local corporation are stepping up and, and, and supporting our honorees and supporting this effort because they understand we push money back into the community for the good. Now, what the Black History Bank Bank with that is, Maurice, how do people see the Charleston County Republican Party from this perspective? It's a a mixed bag. Um, uh, Some question our genuineness, but, you know, that's okay. You you don't stop doing good uh, because your motive is uh, under scrutiny or being uh, questioned. Uh, You know, we we put a lot of effort uh, behind this. This is our our major and most prominent uh, uh, function of the year. Uh, So we put a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of effort into uh, this this banquet. Uh, As we do all of our community engagement uh, projects, uh, my members tell me all the time, you know, we've never done the kinds of things, community things, outreach things uh, that we're doing now. Uh, so so I, I take that, see that as a good thing. And, and I, just, I just think you, you can't be about politics uh, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, uh, you know, every day of the year. I, I, I think there's value in pausing from the politics and the craziness of politics and uh, uh, focusing on, on, on community good. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm proud of CCRP for allowing me and, uh, to take the party uh, into communities and neighborhoods that they have not been familiar with over the years or engaged over the years. What other communities do you want to get familiar with over the next couple of years? Uh, I want to do. I want us to do more in uh, areas like um, Snowden over in the Mount Pleasant area. Uh, a little bit more, and say in Rosemount, uh, which is up in the Neck area. Uh, we're, we're venturing a little bit into the Liberty Hills area as as well. Uh, so areas like those, uh, even though we may touch those areas through our backpack back-to-school backpack, uh, I want more direct engagement. And, and then most of, and we probably touched uh, uh, those communities through our uh, community food giveaway uh, when we partner with the North Charleston uh, Community Resource Center because folks come from all over. Uh, much to our surprise when we did the, the children uh, Christmas uh, toy giveaway this past November, December, um, they were wow, just as many Hispanic children uh, as they were African-American children, uh, which surprised us. I mean, it was almost 50-50 or 60-40 their favor, Hispanic uh, children uh, favor. So, um, so the reach is, is there and, um, and we, we, we give money as well. Uh, and um, so, uh, I'm just excited about the wonderful things we're doing in the out in the areas of um, outreach. I really am. And speaking of numbers, I know earlier you said, "Hey, listen, the party focuses on politics seventy percent of the time and community engagement thirty percent of the time." How much percentage do you want up the community engagement by in the next ten years? Well, you know, I only t- <laughs> I get two years at a time. Okay, uh, and I'm only into my uh, second year as as chair. I was just elected last April, I believe, to a full two-year term. Prior to, it was just completing a, a one-year term uh, of, uh, of another person who had to step aside uh, for business reasons. But um, uh, I, look, I, I want to see this party ultimately become comfortable uh, reaching across the aisle, working in, in, in communities of color, uh, Hispanic community, black community, uh, and, um, and, and it becomes the norm uh, rather than the exception to the norm. Um, I don't think you can wait until uh, the political season to, you know, move into the outreach uh, area, I think, or engagement area. 
I, I think it's important that people need to know that you're genuine, you're there, uh, even when you're not looking for something or trying to become something that you're currently not, uh, but you're there because you care about them, you care about their communities, you care about their children. Uh, and um, uh, so I think it, it, it can't be political driven or seasonal, just meaning around the political time of year. Uh, so we do it year round and, and we're having a great time doing it. And I think it's making a difference. Uh, when President Ronald Reagan once said, quote, the observance of Black History Month serves to focus national attention on an endeavor of awareness that should follow all our status throughout the year. Understanding the history of Black Americans is a key to understanding the strength of our nation. What attention is focused on the endeavor of the awareness in the Black community today? You, you know, there's a lot of attention focused on the Black community. Unfortunately, a lot of what uh, that attention is tend to create a sense of um, victimhood uh, rather than playing to our strength as a people, a people that overcame horrendous uh, suffrage and still rise, uh, a people once set free that were uneducated but somehow found a way what uh, to grow businesses, become millionaires and, and, and great breadwinners of their, of their families, uh, of people that just dominate in every endeavor, be it tennis, be it basketball, football, science. You know, it, the, the, the focus tend to be too much on victimhood rather than the strength of African Americans and our ancestors. And so uh, I think when we start to pivot and, and put the focus on, uh, uh, on, on our strength rather than our suffrage, uh, I think the better and the quicker we become better as a race of people. Does your Republican Party understand the strength of Black America? Uh, I, don't, I don't think in total we do, but I don't think the Democrats does either. Uh, I, I think, I think we, as African Americans, we, we have a greater role to play in making sure that both parties, uh, do right. No one gets a pass here. Uh, and so when, when they try to strap us with victimhood, we push back with still I rise. Uh, and, and we talk about our strength. We talk about our ancestors. We, we talk about from where we started versus uh, where we are today. So, you know, we, we have to re constantly recall and, and celebrate the contributions to our nation made by people of African descent. Now, the pres President Reagan had also said, quote, their struggles, achievements, and perseverance help understand the moral fiber of America and our commitment to freedom equality and justice. But then what struggles, achievements, and perseverance helps the Charleston County Republican Party better understand the morale fiber of the black community? I, I think I think events like the event coming up on the eleventh, our annual Black History Month banquet, where we look, we don't sugarcoat uh, the past. Uh, I think we have I can't give away all of our secrets, but I think we have a compelling message uh, this uh, Friday, February 11th. Uh, and it is my hope that as a result of the things that we have planned for this year's Black History Banquet, uh, well, let me put it this way. Yes. If, if, you, if you leave as a, as a white citizen feeling white guilt, you have missed the message. If you leave that banquet as a, as a black citizen, uh, feeling black victimhood, you have missed the message that we were, that we're attempting to deliver. 
uh, this is, um, uh, we got to be true to our history on both sides, right? Can't watch the history. And I don't think we should be erasing or, uh, or purging history. I think that's the worst thing we can do. Uh, I think we learn from it because that's how you keep score from where we were to where we are as we continue to do what? Build that perfect union. So events like this, uh, maybe it's not for everybody, but for those who have an open mind, they're going to get some realness on February. And, and that realness is going to be, boom, right from the beginning to the very end. And I think that's an important part, Quentin, of, um, of achieving uh, the kind of results we need to achieve to the question that you just posed to me. Now, but what is your commitment as the Charleston County Republican Party to helping black, the black community achieve freedom, equality, and obviously justice in 2022? Yeah, well, the, the commitment is, uh, is very real. Uh, and it's not just using the Charleston County Republican Party as a vessel, uh, but using a number of uh, institutions as vessels to helping African American uh, uh, experience the type of inclusion uh, and opportunities that the American dream promises to all citizens, right? Uh, so I, I don't do it by beating a drum, uh, blowing a trumpet. Uh, I do my work in a more quiet kind of way. And results speaks for themselves. I don't boast about the results. I don't draw attention uh, to the results because that's not why I do and others do what it is that we do. Uh, we, uh, uh, going back to a story Senator Ford once told me when I was new to city council, he called me up one morning. I was very new, the youngest on the uh, council at the time. And he, he referred to me as young blood. He said, look here, I see you up there trying to raise a little hell at the council meeting yesterday. That's not you, man. That's not your place. That's not your style. He said, you know, um, it's not detergent that cleans uh, clothes when you put it in the washing machine. It's the agitation that cleans them. You let me be the agitator. Because that's what I'm good at. And you take your educated butt in that room and you negotiate for us. So I'll be the agitator, you be the negotiator. And, uh, and I think that would work best and, and we should get some real good things done. I'll never forget that. Uh, so there is value uh, to um, having agitators as well as negotiators. And, um, and that's a valuable lesson that I learned from that guy former state senator robert ford and, and i course, still practice and implement that today yeah and of course he was on a city council for many years uh with uh, mayor Riley. but let me ask you this what will be your style as far as leading the charleston county republican party from here on out good question well you know my, my style is uh i i try not to get emotional right uh you, you, we got a lot of angry people uh, and, and angry for uh, a variety of different reasons. and 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 they they vent at at some of our meetings and and so it's important that um, uh, that I try to listen uh, to understand before demanding that uh, that I'm understood right so all of last year because we we've grown from maybe 30, 40 people per meeting to now over 100 people per meeting. Uh, all of our auxiliaries are exploding uh, with um, uh, local participation. Ex and I mean exploding, seeing crazy high numbers of people coming out. And, and so those folks come with different backgrounds, different mindset, yes, different agendas, uh, and they're seeking answers and they just want to run through walls to get involved to, to quote unquote save the country make the country better uh and when you have that many new people coming in now is not the time for you to try to force your will and 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 who you are forcing them to understand who you are no you have to understand you know your your your, your members and what's important to them uh, so that you can then maybe put forth 
uh, an agenda that incorporates these these new ideas and old ideas and bring the balance uh, to the table. So my first year, all of last year, I simply spent uh, maybe listening, being tolerant, understanding, and patient. Unfortunately, you know, some people uh, uh, may uh, mistake that for a sign of weakness, uh, but you don't grow up back to green public housing and in, in downtown Charleston uh, as a black man only to become a weak man later in life, right? No, 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 no. Uh, but so I spent all year trying to understand them and this year i'm kind of putting my will forcing my will uh so that they understand me i'm not taking sides with any bubbles within the big bubble right i want to understand these different bubbles uh and uh and i'm not going to favor one over the, over the other i'm going to make decisions based on what i believe is right that's my style and that upset people from time to time but that's okay too uh, just because someone get upset you know, it, it doesn't mean that um, uh, that you should not do what you believe is right and best for the big picture and the whole team. So it's it's patience, it's understanding, it's it's, it's loyalty, uh, and um, but it's also laced over with um, real strength and real toughness. Now, what new ideas would you put on your agenda today? Well, we've, oh man, I tell you what, put a lot of new ideas uh, on the agenda. I tell you, we, to my knowledge, we've never had an education standing committee uh, because, you know, we as a party just didn't think getting involved with local education as, as, as a productive thing. Well, uh, as a result of the education committee and uh, and what's happening in our schools. Um, uh, we are now fully engaged with uh, school board elections. We haven't been so in the, we are now. We're more engaged with uh, nonpartisan, and that's a nonpartisan deal too, by the way. They don't run partisan, they, they run nonpartisan. So, but we're involved with school board elections now. Uh, we're involved with nonpartisan city council, Charleston City Council election, Town of Mount Pleasant ele elections. I'm sure we'll be engaged with city council, North Charleston City Council, countywide election. So uh, we're more more involved uh, in in you know. So that's kind of new uh, to us, the education arena, the non the uh, nonpartisan election arena. We we're really really stepping up our game uh, in those areas. While at the same time, uh, those community outreach activities are very, very important, very near and dear to the hearts of many of our members. And again, oftentimes they approach me and they tell me, man, I, you know, I'm glad we're doing this. We haven't done it in the past. This is the right thing to do. Uh, and um, uh, anyway, we're making a difference and for the better. And I'm really, really proud of that. Now, how does this Black History Banquet event bring in people who may not look to the Charleston County Republican Party? Well, you know, uh, and you've experienced this, uh, it's a very diverse group of people that comes together. Uh, Democrats and Republicans and independents, young, not so young, uh, wealthy, not so wealthy. Um, people who thought they had nothing in common uh, come together and discover, whoa, we have lots in common. They've been lifetime friendship or, or lasting friendships, I should say, that have come as a result of the Black History Month banquet. People met for the first time at the very first one who are still having coffee with each other to this very, very day. Uh, and I think that's a pretty... Uh, a, a cool thing and uh, so if but for two and a half hours you know people come together put aside political differences uh, uh, reflect on a past that none of us are proud of uh, with a eye on the future which is where 
all of us, you and me and the rest of us will spend the rest of our lives in the future. And, and just be neighbors again. Be respectful to one another. If only for that two and a half hours. Fortunately, uh, and hopefully, it will last the remaining of their lives. Uh, and that, of course, would be uh, the ultimate good that can come out of it. And then lastly on that, yes, sir. It, it's the people that we recognize. I mean, look at your story, Quentin. Uh, yours is not a normal story. What you are doing today, people don't know the struggles that that you endured and and roles where you can pull videos of you interviewing governors and senators and house of representatives and mayors yep. and community yep. activists and leaders yep. uh i mean are you kidding me uh and, and the way you did it and you didn't let or allow Oh, well, I don't have a car to get to that next run. You know, you hop a bus. I've seen you making it, navigating streets when the temperature is 90 plus degrees, humidity over 100. And, but you, you got it done, man. And look at you today. One of the most respected, not African-American, but one of the most respected citizens in all of our area. And you know that, but you, you did it the way our ancestors did it. And so you're the type of person we need to recognize and, and put in the front of our young men and women today. You know, you didn't, you didn't settle for victimhood. You know, you rose above that stuff. And you know, I, I don't have all the tools I need, but damn it, what I have, I'm going to make work and all of your stuff. Everything that you produce have been produced at a high quality level. Am I right or wrong? You're right. You're right. So but you're an example of what I'm talking about, my brother. You are an example of what I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't know think about me, but um, those two hours. So tell us, let's reset. Who, what, when, and where? Well, <laughs> you know, I spoke about the honorees right, right, right. you spoke about the where francis marion hotel right. february 11th yeah. uh but but we also have some incredible sponsors uh that we couldn't have done this event without um uh we have state representative shadow murray as one of our sponsors i personally and my wife we are sponsors of this year's banquet we have um uh, Neil Brothers, Charleston Incorporated, uh, Inc., uh, Neil Brothers. We have uh, Construction Dynamics. We have Matthew Lieber uh, for State House 116, Aflac, uh, Sodexo Magic, uh, CCSD, Pinnacle, Senator Tim Scott, twice over uh, a sponsor, uh, Ted Turner, Roy Maybank, uh, and, and I believe that covers everyone. So a lot of corporate entities and people came together uh and and purchased sponsorships uh at two thousand dollars a pop i might add we have folks taking out ads kathy landing henry fishburn chris dobbs uh top shelf uh uh candidate uh lens lens loomis running for the first congressional district so we we have folks supporting this because they believe in community and they want to give back and they know that we put these profits uh, uh, to good community use. And, and I can't say goodbye without talking about our keynote speaker, uh, Selena Cuff, who is a globally recognized entrepreneur and executive who believes uh, a successful business can empower community. So that fits right into our banquet. Um, and she is the president of Sodexo Magic, a $600 million joint venture between NBA legend and Hall of Famer, Urban Magic Johnson Jr. and Sodexo. And so she's business partner with the basketball legend, uh, Urban Magic Johnson. And she's not charging us a penny 
to fly in from California, to spend two nights, to deliver a keynote message to us at the banquet at zero cost to our bottom line. So that's money instead of putting into her as our speaker, we get to put what? Reinvest back into our community. And now, that's incredible, Quentin. Yes, sir. And how do we purchase tickets? Uh, you go to charlestonrepublicans.com and the, the ticket um, uh, uh, button will pop up. You just tap on it and uh, follow the prompt, purchase your tickets. Your name will appear on our data list, guest list. You show up at the event and uh, give your name. We check you off. We're going to have an incredible menu as well. Uh, you know, folks have asked, well, what are you going to have? What's, what's the menu? Well, I want you to know, you're getting this firsthand, uh, uh, Quentin. We're going to have, uh, for dinner, yeah. we're going to have beef short ribs. Beef short ribs. Now, for vegetarians, uh, if you can't do that, we'll have stuffed portobello mushrooms uh, for as a dietary uh, restriction entree. Uh, and uh, we're going to have uh, collard greens and red rice and an incredible uh, dessert to go with that. Uh, open bar, whole gamut, entertainment, Crystal Haywood, okay. and and the um, uh, the plantation singers. Uh, not to mention Burke High School Band will also be on hand to provide some entertainment as well. So we got, got to give a shout out to Leonard McLeod and, right. and our alma mater, yours yep. and mine, Burke yep. High School. Yep. They will be there. In fact, I will be awarding them, presenting them with a check as well because they are deserving of that. And I can't wait to do that. So uh, there you have it. But you got everything out of me before Channel 2, before Channel 5, <laughs> and Channel 4, and the Post and Court. <laughs> Only quick you can manage to make that happen. <laughs> You're the great for God in Jesus. Well, Maurice <laughs> Washington, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you, sir. Always yeah. enjoy it, Quentin. And I hope to get you back on later this spring when Quentin's Close Ups becomes 10 years. Oh my God! You got to have me back for that. Yeah, we, no, that has to. No, we we got to do better than that. We got to first go out to a dinner and and toast and and celebrate the toast written on that one. Yes, sir. That, that's, that's a milestone. That's a crazy accomplishment. Crazy good accomplishment. I might add. Yeah, you. I agree. I agree. It's coming up in May, so I'll I'll let you know more. <laughs>